Oh, wait, sorry. Ow. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to DCPS uh, Parent University. My name is Taylor Stanley, and I am the Family Engagement Specialist for DC Public Schools. This is my daughter, Amari Catherine. Uh, she will be my co-host today, and hopefully she'll be uh, easy to, to work with. Um, so suffice to say that I will be learning some tips from our amazing uh, uh, experts uh, to provide strategies for how to you know, manage her stress because it's stressful for her. Um, so, and you will be learning similar tips for your home as well. So I'm so glad that you all are joining us. Just as a uh, heads up, um, we do have subtitles available um, in uh, Chinese, French, uh, Spanish, and Vietnamese. And um, we also have DCPS staff who are available to answer questions in Spanish and French. Um, so if you follow the directions um, on the screen um, to start the, um, the subtitles, that'll allow folks um, to follow along in, in the language of their choosing. Um, this is a really great feature that uh, we're excited about. Um, and so uh, we'd love to hear um, from you all how, how it managed afterwards. So uh, today we'll be uh, starting off. Uh, we're on Microsoft Teams. For those of you all, for those of you all who aren't familiar, Microsoft Teams is what many of our schools are using uh, to support our students dur during distance, uh, uh, social distancing, and, and distance learning. Um, then we'll hop into what Parent University is. For some of you, you may you may have come to previous workshops for Parent University, um, or this may be your first one. Then we'll dive into the brain and understanding your child's reaction to stress. Um, then we'll be talking about strategies you can use to help children cope. You all right, Mama? It's OK. Um, so for Microsoft Teams, we have this amazing uh, Q&A feature. Um, it, allows us to keep, it allows us to keep the conversation going um, while also um, while also answering your questions. So we actually have uh, two folks from the school mental health team who will be able to answer your questions. Um, very specific, they can answer your specific questions as well. Um, we do ask that when you post in the Q&A that you assume best intentions. Uh, you go hard on ideas, not on people, and you accept non-closure. Um, I also do want to flag that this is a moderated Q&A, so we may not post every single question um, or comment. Um, and also, uh, we do have the ability to keep certain uh, questions private. And so if you'd like your question to be private, uh, feel free to mark um, that you'd like to, feel free to write in that you'd like it to be private and we won't publish it. Um, we want to respect your privacy. We do have people on our end who are able to see your private questions. So I do want to keep that in mind, though. I want, I want you to keep that in mind. So a little bit about Parent University. Uh, Parent University started off as an in-person workshop for DCPS families. Uh, we were hosting it at two schools. Uh, now we've taken it online to be able to reach more families, which is exciting. Um, it's an opportunity um, to share what you know. So that's a way to use the, um, the Q&A as well. If you have any tips, any strategies that you use with your child, share them. Um, to hear from DCPS, we have amazing experts who are here to, to share with us the signs that your child may be sad or stressed. Um, and so being able to hear from them, being able to ask them questions is, is an amazing uh, opportunity. And then also learning from other families. So if other families are posting um, their recommendations, uh, feel for, like that's, that's the space to learn in. Um, Parent University is still growing. We're still developing workshops, um, but we're excited to see how we can expand this program online. So uh, part of the foundation that we build uh, Parent University on is that five fa is that families play five roles in accelerating student learning. So communicating high expectations, um, making sure that your child is knows the importance of continuing to 
you know, work, do their homework, even when they're not in school right now, uh, to monitor their performance. When you check in on them to see uh, if for high school families, if you're checking Aspen, or um, if you're checking in with your child's teacher to make sure to make sure that they're even logged on, right? You're monitoring your child's performance, supporting learning at home, uh, creating a space for your child to, to learn. Uh, come around, mama, come around. Creating a space for your child to learn um, and and create consistency for them, that's supporting learning at home. Um, when you're guiding a child's education, for a lot of you, um, the, the, your, your school lottery results might have come in. It's all right, Mama. It's okay. It's okay. Your school lottery results might have come in. And so making that decision, knowing that you'll have to be making that decision soon, um, that's guiding your child's education, advocating for your child, continuing to let us know um, how your child is doing, whether whether or not we're missing the mark, whether or not we're doing a great job in, in providing for you and your child's needs, that's advocating for your child. When you check in and send a picture to your child's teacher showing them, look, you know, uh, Tommy is doing his packet. That's, that is also advocating for your child. And a lot of you all I know are doing this already and you're doing an amazing job. Kids are a handful, right? Um, so we have some amazing panelists who will help us uh, as parents manage our children and their, and their stress and, and help manage their expectations. So we have uh, William Blake. He's the director of uh, social emotional learning and school culture. Uh, we have Kenya Coleman. Uh, she is the Senior Director of School Mental Health. We have Douglas Gotell, the Director of Trauma Responsive uh, Schools Initiatives. And then we have Nigel Jackson, who's the Director of School Mental Health. And so um, if you all ever have questions about mental health services or, or uh, additional questions about uh, ways to support your child, um, I want to make sure that you all have this email address down, uh, school.mentalhealth at k12.dc.gov. And um, what's great about this is that you'll have our DCPS school mental health professionals uh, answer these questions, answer questions for you there as well. Um, and so this this email address will pop up in various places in the, in the workshop because I want to make sure that you all as families have access to the mental health supports that you need. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. William Blake. Thank you, Taylor. I greatly appreciate it. And um, before I start, Taylor, I just want to uh, commend you just on your transparency and vulnerability in being a parent right now. Um, and you know what um, you are showing right now is uh, how difficult it is to like balance this um, uh, working from home while also uh, supporting your, your your students at the same time. So thank you for just being very transparent and open um, in your uh, vulnerability, um, vulnerability as a parent um, during this moment. For the, um, my remaining parents, thank you all for um, joining us today. And as Taylor um, provided a great um, narration to, uh, we're going to um, share some tips and some strategies and some resources on how you can manage your student stress from home. So today we're going to um, cover three skills where we're going to ground you in some context around how stress um, affects the brain. And for those of us that were on the last time, uh, you all have seen this uh, material. However, we want to be sure to ground um, each presentation that we do around stress, around that brain-based research. Then we're going to um, share um, some um, indicators of how you can identify stress within your students and your students' behavior, and then help you with some strategies of like how to help your students cope with stress. So first of all, let's talk about this brain, right? And for um, some of my parents, you have might have seen this before, and for my new parents, uh, I want to share with this um, this picture of this is what the brain looks like when the three main learning centers are working in um, collaboration with one another. So we have what you call the prefrontal cortex, which I call is the CEO and the headquarters of the brain. This is where you re regulate all of your thoughts, emotions, and your behavior, right? Then you have your hippocampus, which is located in the central part of your brain, and this is where all the memory is stored. And then you have the amygdala, um, which is um, reacts to stress and your emotional responses. So prior to COVID-19, 
Um, this is a picture of the brain where all three learning centers are working in tandem with one another, uh, making sure that we can navigate through um, anything that we face in our um, average um, way of life. Now, let's move to a, another picture of the brain to show you how stress affects the brain. Now, think about this, right? Um, when stress is very heavy on the brain, the prefrontal cortex, um, it is not able to like regulate thoughts and regulate emotions, and uh, which causes you to act like very irrational and um, you're not able to control your, your bodily actions. When it comes to the hippocampus, when stress is impacting on the brain, you are not able to reflect on your memory or you're not able to, um, to store um, new learning or new memory as well. But most importantly, the most effective part of the brain when stress um, is impacted is um, the amygdala. And the amygdala uh, allows you to really control your emotional responses. But when the amygdala has a lot of stress, you are um, being very grouchy or very evil um, to your spouse or to your students or, or to your children or things of that nature. So with this concept, um, I would like for everyone just to take a moment and think about the current state of our graduating class of 2020 of how our seniors might feel. Our seniors might feel very stressed out right now because they have the possibility of not having a traditional graduation and the traditional prom and to enjoy the, um, the traditional senior activities. So this is a picture of how most of our seniors' um, brains might be looking at this current moment where they have a lot of stress that they need to impact. And for the remainder of this, we're going to share with you some strategies of how to help them cope with that stress that they might be um, experiencing. So when I go to the next slide, I definitely want to share how important it is for our parents um, to ensure that our students continue uh, like healthy, um, healthy building blocks of um, student development while learning at home. So what you see before you is what we call our building blocks for student success. However, I just want you to focus on the very first building block where it says healthy attachment. Uh, um, health, healthy um, development. And with that, for our parents and families, I want you to focus on that attachment block. Parents, you play an integral role to, in, um, to building those positive relationships with your students in that attachment block. Research says when students have healthy relationships with adults, rather they are parents um, or educators or um, another adult in the school, they are able to um, build on these building blocks to um, achieve optimal success in school. So it starts at home with that attachment block. And if you are able to like identify different stresses um, within your students, you are able to form strong attachments with them to build quality relationships. Now I am going to pass it on to my colleagues who are going to share with you, you know, like different students behaviors and the stress that it might bring and how can you cope with um, different stress and um, support your students to manage their stress at home. All right, Kenya, you're on mute right now. Thank you, Taylor, because I was having a full on conversation over here. I'm sure but it was good great, afternoon, though. everyone. Um, the last time we were together, we shared information with you to help you manage doing these um, admittedly difficult times. Our thought was to make sure you had your oxygen mask on so that you could effectively help your students do the same. Today, we want to spend some time with you um, so that we can help you help them. Stress in children and youth often shows up as anxiety, which is excessive worrying or sadness. We're going to start by addressing signs and symptoms of anxiety. Like many signs and symptoms, those associated with anxiety can rely on a continuum such that it's either too much or too little. An example of this is defiance and over planning. They're both attempts to gain control. Children, especially young children, may not have the language to say, I'm scared. However, they can set limits. So 
refusing to eat the dinner that you took all afternoon to cook may not simply be your student being difficult for the sake of being difficult. Your student may be stressed. Other students may choose to routinize every moment of the day to make sure they're not taken by surprise. You may also find that your student is noticeably negative. He or she may have a really hard time finding something good to say. Even their favorite people may be subject to criticism. There are some um, shared sy systems of anxiety and sadness. They mimic each other. Both impact mood, both can impact attention, and both can change sleeping patterns. Students can be irritable. Because they're uncertain or unsure, they want to be left alone until they're able to figure out what's going on. And while their wheels are turning, trying to find solutions to the chaos they may be experiencing, they will have a remarkably difficult time focusing on anything else. And their sleep may be interrupted or it may increase. Sadness sets itself apart though, because it cannot be manipulated. Even your students' most favorite activities will no longer be fun. Their energy may decrease and everything may seem boring. Hopelessness and helplessness are hallmark signs of sadness, especially when coupled with the other signs and symptoms that I've shared with you this afternoon. You may also notice changes in your students' eating habits. Either they're eating too much or eating very little. Last but certainly not least, pay attention to the work that your sons or daughters may be producing at this time. If hopelessness and helplessness are persistent themes, your student's sadness could be evidence of a depressed mood. Hey, Kenya, I have I have a couple of questions for you, if that's OK. Sure. Um, for our families who are who have teenagers, where some of these things like maybe overeating or you know saying I'm not hungry might you know sometimes we think like that you know that's just the territory that comes with being a, a parent of a teenager um what like how do you know um if it's just like you know my kids you know my kids just grow in pains or if it's something to be concerned about thank you I appreciate that question Taylor um because I do want to emphasize that demonstrating one of these signs or symptoms is not necessarily an opportunity to worry as a parent. As a parent, um, I would become concerned if my student was demonstrating several signs and symptoms. So not just overeating or undereating, but um, in addition to that, we are noticing the hopelessness and the helplessness, for example. We're also noticing that they are no longer doing the things that they used to enjoy. Um, so no one sign or symptom it is cause for um, clinical concern. But if you see your student demonstrating um, multiple signs and symptoms, then I would recommend that you get additional support to help your student. That's really helpful. I appreciate that. Um. So I also wanted to um, as, as Taylor was saying, there are some signs and symptoms that are consistent with simply being a, a teenager. There are also some things that are part of our shared experience. 
So for me, I have certainly been, been bored, bored enough to watch all seven episodes of Tiger King plus the bonus episode. <laughs> I've also increased my snacking, um, but I feel like this is a part of our shared experience during this particular time. We have provided two one pagers. Um, you can access them in the bit.ly, I believe, that call out some of the common signs and symptoms of both anxiety and depression. And I would encourage um, parents to review that particular document. And if you have concerns, I want you to know that support is available to you and your student. At this particular time, all school-based mental health teams are still meeting and supporting students. If you would like for your student to be linked to a school mental health provider, you can email us at school.mentalhealth at k12.dc.gov or you can access the service by contacting your principal and asking him or her for next steps. Um, the Department of Behavioral Health is also supporting families. Um, you can contact them at their access helpline, which is 1-888-7-WE-HELP or 1-888-793-4357. And last but certainly not least, if you have access to private insurances, there are many um, providers who are in network that ha are providing um, teletherapy. So you do not have to feel like you are alone. I do not want you to feel like there is not support available to you while students are learning from home. We are here to support you. By we, I mean um, the school mental health team and our school-based um, mental health providers. The Department of Behavioral Health is available to support you and many insurances um, have encouraged their providers to provide services remotely. You are not alone. Thank you, Kenya. Um, we, we, no, I, I, I appreciate you leaning into the um, the teenager question, particularly because, as I said, you know, parent, you know, we do have a, a, some parents who are who know that their their children are trying to create some sense of of normalcy and and their reactions might uh, be different like their sleep um and uh you know monitoring their weight but um you know i think driving home the point of you know your child best yeah. um and so you know like what seems out of character for them versus like what seems like a natural adjustment for them right. um but i think knowing these signs um it is still important um so so thank you thank, thank you for that thank you and so while there is definitely um clinical intervention that is available to parents we want you to know that there are some things that you can do at home um also to support your students okay um, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Coleman. My name is Nigel Jackson. I'm the director of school mental health, and I want to continue along the same lines that Dr. Coleman and Taylor just discussed. Um, having a routine can help you get that consistency and control um, back into your life. So having predictable rhythms and routines in your day or over the course of a week it can be very calming and reassuring and can help you manage your stress. Developing a routine can help you feel more in control. It can help deal with change. A routine can help form healthy habits and it can reduce stress levels. Routines can include a myriad of things, regular times for waking up, exercise, taking breaks, eating breakfast, snack, lunch, bedtimes. Um, one of the things you can do as a routine, uh, um, which I know some folks who do this, you can schedule certain work related things during a baby's nap time. Of course, they won't adhere to it when you have very important work things to do, but you can schedule it and attempt to make it part of your routine. They you won't. can also <laughs> say it again, Taylor. They won't. They no. will not adhere to it. No, they will not. They will not. But you could still try, but they probably will not. You could also not schedule certain work related things during a small child's virtual class time. If your child is eight 
and let's say you know they have math from 9 to 10 a.m try not to schedule your major meetings from 9 to 10 because you know that that's the key portion of their uh, virtual workday virtual class time um, you can also maybe do a routine where you schedule a phone call between your child and a friend during a certain time or different friends or family during a certain time of day and build that into your routine. So every day from 1 to 1.30, your child speaks with their best friend in class on the virtual platform that their school is using or that they want to use, or just a phone call. You can also do a routine such as when you know you're not going to be using the video conference, maybe when you're just taking a phone call, you can take that phone call outside to get that fresh air and remind yourself that you need a break and to step away. Uh, we all experience stress when we feel the demands outweigh the resources we have to successfully cope. Building in routines can anchor us, give us a structure, and provide us with a few more resources to meet the demands of our lives. I'm going to now pass it to my colleague, Mr. Douglas Gotell, who's going to continue sharing different strategies to help cope. Thank you, Nigel. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Douglas Gotell. I'm the Director for Trauma Responsive Schools Initiatives uh, on our school mental health team. For many children and, and youth, uh, as Dr. Blake mentioned earlier, one of uh, some of the most disappointing aspects of this pandemic is the cancellation of important experiences, sports season, after school act activities, play dates, and gathering with friends. And with that, um, you know, I offer the, the two E's, um, and that is empathizing and, and encourage. Uh, that's one of the, the, the most important things to do um, when children uh, are, are upset, uh, is to empathize with them. And you know, acknowledge what you know is frustrating for them, uh, that it's, it's frustrating to be cut off from friends or you know, that we have not been able to, to hang out uh, or do some of the things uh, that we used to do, like having play dates. Uh, listen to what your children are saying, validate those feelings, and then you can be direct about how you can work together to make the situation more bearable. Now for your teenagers, you want to have an open mind uh, so uh, because they will come with different types of suggestions, but keep an open mind with them. Uh, acknowledge the experience, validate the sadness or frustration, and you can do that by saying things like, you know, that, that must feel awful, uh, or I can see why that makes you upset. Uh, your classmates and, and many other kids feel the same way you do all over the city. I'd like for us to work together to think about uh, how we can make the most of the situation. Or for your younger kids, you might say, you know, let's think about how we can make this situation less sad for everybody. And that's where you invite problem solving. Um, but when we're empathizing, it, it is important to uh, make sure that you center around the child's experience rather than, you know, sharing in a comparative way your experience like we always sometimes say, you know, well, I was your age. We want to avoid that type of a statement when we're empathizing with our child because that's going to, that may invalidate what they're saying. Sometimes words and reasoning may not be the most effective way to reach a child. Um, who may be reluctant or, or who has difficulty expressing themselves with one another. Sometimes our students need a buffer to create a, a safe emotional distance between themselves and their experiencing in order to share their most innermost thoughts and experiences. Um, for children, you can use art uh, and play and for teens, you can use physical activities to help with what we call externalizing feelings, getting them out. These feelings facilitators, as I call them, art, play, and movement 
Well, they they kind of act like a, a, a third party, a neutral third party, almost like a, a social buffer. And they help calm the stress response and make the thinking and reasoning part of the brain more accessible. I can't tell you how many times I've spent walking with uh, teenagers throughout school, school buildings, um, hearing them out, just hearing them out, just walking uh, and hearing them out or doing free throws or attempting to do free throws uh, with, with them at the basketball court because goodness knows I'm not the best basketball player. But, you know, doing that while having a casual conversation and using the game, the activity to weave in and out of questions or reflections that help me to uh, get a better understanding of where that, that, that young person was coming from. Now, with art, um, and Taylor, this one, you can go to the to the next slide on, uh, but art um, with younger kids, and, you can, and, and art is also, you know, effective with, uh, with, with teenagers as well, but art gives you access to your children when words and reasoning don't. Um, and certainly with so much time that everyone's spending together, uh, conflicts are going to arise, and I know you're living that when your needs and maybe your kids' needs are mismatched in the moment. And at these times, you can use the creative arts to reconnect with your child and to help resolve problems. Um, art lowers defenses and opens lines of communications after upset. Art is metaphorical. Uh, it can be playful. And this way of communicating is on a child's home turf. This is how this is their language. Um, and reconnecting through art, uh, you know, it could take several forms. How you reconnect takes several forms. Um, and that's up to you because you know your child best. Some kids need to acknowledge their feelings. Dr. Coleman kind of alluded to this earlier. Some kids need to just stew in their feelings for a minute and be with their arms folded for a while. Uh, some kids just need quiet and away time. And then some kids literally need to move their body to get the energy out, to discharge that energy. But I wanna share with you uh, one idea that you can use to try um, at home with your kids and you, it's illustrated here on, this, on the screen. You can use art as a way to, to empathize with your child. Um, you can let your child know how upset he or she is by, uh, and this is on the right side, just drawing a sad or angry face and you might write a simple message that goes with it that says, I'm sorry, or we both got angry. And even if your child isn't a reader yet, written words can sometimes open up the conversation because they may ask, well, what does this one say? And that's your invitation. That's your bridge uh, into that child's inner world. Now, there's another way to, to do that, a slightly different way to do this, and this is where I want your participation, um, those who are with us to, today. I want you to just find any piece of paper that you have near you, um, any with a blank side on it, uh, any piece of paper and a writing utensil, pencil uh, or pen. So just grab that for a moment, whatever you have near you. And I want you to draw two circles uh, like you see here uh, on the left side of the screen. Good sized circles that you're going to draw in them. Give you a moment for that. On one circle, you're going to write at the top of that circle, me. That circle is going to represent you or you could write your name um, above it. And on the second circle, I want you to write you above it, or you can write your child's name. And simply um, what you would write, what you would draw in that first circle is, you know, whatever context it is, what, whatever has happened with, you know, with, with, your, with your child or with you and your child, you draw a face that represents what you're thinking or what you're feeling. Um, so I'll let you do that right now. Just whatever you're feeling today, just draw that. Uh, inside of the circle that represents you. Take a take a minute to do that. It can be about about anything. And you don't have to be an artist to do this. 
This is about connecting with, with your child and it doesn't have to be perfect. OK, so you have your face and it might be a, a sad or confused face in the me circle. And then what you would do is without words, just pass that paper to your child who may be sitting next to you. And that is the invitation for, for your child um, to share their feelings in a way that's going to be easier than telling you with words. You just drew something, they saw you do it, you pass the paper to them, they see you, you've modeled an action for them. They would naturally mimic you as, as the child. And you can write a bubble over the circle representing, you know, what your that figure that's representing you, what they're thinking or what they're feeling. And if your child doesn't quite understand that cue, you can offer some assistance by saying, my person is saying, I'm sorry. Uh, and then you could ask, what does your person say? My person is sad. Or show me what your person looks like. So that's the cue that builds that that bridge through this medium uh, of, of art. So that's a very simple way to connect, reconnect with your child. And I hope that that is one that you are able to, to use at home. I'm going to toss this one back to Mr. Jackson, who's going to talk about using some of the some art based techniques with uh, with your with your teenager. Uh oh, Nigel, you're on mute. How about here we go? There we go. All right. Sorry about that. So Douglas just shared with us some excellent techniques through the use of art for our younger children, and we can mimic many of those same techniques working with teenagers through art journaling. Art journaling can be a very fun way of engaging in self care while tapping into your creative side. Now, I can't draw myself, but I always have fun when I'm doing it, and there are many, many benefits to art journaling. Like I already stated, it's fun. It's a form of self care. It allows you to explore your feelings. It also develops creativity, and I want to take a minute to explain that. When you journal, you're accessing the left hemisphere of your brain, which is analytical and rational. Dr. Blake touched on this earlier in the presentation. And when your left brain is occupied, your right brain is free to create and feel. Journaling removes mental blocks and allows us to use more of our brain power to better understand ourselves and the bigger world around us. There is research that suggests journaling stimulates an area of the brain called the reticular activating system or RAS, which filters and brings clearly to the forefront the information that we're focusing on. Art journaling strengthens T lymphocytes and has been shown to be associated with the reduction in depression, anxiety, and increases positive mood, social engagement, and quality of close relationships. It provides you with health benefits as well, such as reducing heart rate, increasing serotonin flow, and decreasing stress responses. Most importantly for me, more than the health and the physical benefits that we just shared above, the mental health benefits, art journaling may also keep you from editing your words or poems or pictures. Sometimes when we get into the pattern of typing, we use that backspace button and it sort of reinforces that you can consistently edit. But it's very important, especially for our teenagers during those adolescent years, that they learn that it's OK to make a mistake and that they express themselves creatively without second guessing. So in sum, art journaling has a positive effect on your fun, your self care, creativity, concentration, mental health, physical health and emotional health.
The next slide that we're going to cover is another strategy that we've entitled creativity. So the balancing act, as we've called this presentation, is a very poetic way to frame a very difficult experience. Just this morning, I fell off the proverbial seesaw because I didn't balance well. I felt a pressure to meet a few work demands and consequently I focused exclusively on them and pushed my wife and children to the back burner. I didn't recognize the signs that I was needed in my family demands because I didn't want to. If I would have recognized them, I would have been responsible to do something about it, which would have then interfered with my meeting my work demands. Long story short, the stress that my wife experienced because I left her to manage her work and our children's demands ultimately created a not so great vibe in my house. This is an example that some of you may be able to relate to. The balancing act is not a perfect science, but if we try to incorporate some of these strategies, we can find new ways to stay on that seesaw. So using creativity is a major strategy to help you manage these demands that you may be experiencing. By now you may be familiar with the infamous social media DJ and artist battles on Instagram. You may also be familiar with the video conferencing with family and friends to create a sense of social interaction, albeit virtual. There are virtual platforms where you can not only video conference, but you can play interactive games and activities while video conferencing, such as House Party and Padlet. One of our DC public schools used Padlet last week to support its student population by building a, a memory wall for one of their students who lost his life. Um, another form of creativity you can use, uh, you can take introductory lessons to learn a new language. There's also some non-screen related creativity as well. Exercise can be made fun at home. You can exercise together as a family. If you have small children, you could just let them run around you while you exercise. You can include household items to simulate weights or gym equipment. You can use water jugs, toilet paper if you still have some to pick up and turn around and put down and turn around and pick up and turn around and put down but you can be creative and using the things that are right in your place uh, another strategy you can do is to look up a new recipe and try it on your own or with family members i see taylor nodding her head maybe she's tried that one um, and last but not least i have one uh, creative suggestion that might be a little different from some of the ones you've heard before being cooped up in your apartment or your house all day with your husband or wife or children is hard for everybody it is only natural to have some conflict from time to time one way to express your creativity is to challenge yourself to decrease the amount of disagreements you have you know the people you live with better than anyone you know their triggers and they most likely know yours so be creative and challenge yourself to think of how you can reduce those instances. OK, I'm going to um, pass it back to my colleague Douglas Gotell. OK, so we've had a lot of discussion, you know, over these these last two webinars, just, you know, about emotions and, and stress uh, and coping. But I want to put some things in context, you know, about this discussion um, uh, about emotions. And sometimes some emotions get a real bad rep, right? Um, like anger and guilt, but our emotions do have different functions um, and you know no one wants to feel stressed no one wants to feel frustrated no one wants to feel angry uh, or sad but they do serve different functions some that are more adaptive than, than others uh, anger and guilt for for example while they don't feel good and we try to avoid them avoid them uh, these are emotions that 
also can inspire us to action that's in the service uh, of a value. Um, and so think of it, you know, that way, you know, that our, our angers do have uh, some very um, primitive function in our in our evolution. They're there for for a reason. Um, but sometimes they do, you know, we get heightened uh, in, in certain emotions and they get the best of us. Um, but there are three basic ways to to cope with high emotions and reduce or to shut off the stress response in your body. Uh, the first one is talking yourself through it with more rational or positive thinking, being aware uh, of when we're emotionally hooked, as Dr. Brene uh, Brown uh, talks about it, um, when we uh, are in a mind trap um, and our emotions are, are out of control and our imaginations about what has happened or going to happen is out of control. So we talk ourselves through it. The other thing we can do is to self-soothe through mindful breathing or engaging the senses to send signals uh, of calm into the brain. And then thirdly, you can distract yourself with activities that activate the thinking and memory parts uh, of the brain. And, um, uh, and and Nigel mentioned that so uh, so eloquently uh, about the left and the, the right parts uh, of the brain. So when we distract ourselves with, with activity, we're activating these other parts of the brain and that, that helps to turn off that amygdala uh, response. And it's also important to know, you know, you know, these types of grounding uh, techniques uh, that I'll go over, um, they can be used to, you know, kind of set the stage before you attempt to do problem solving with, with your child. Because when we're in a heightened emotional state, that part of the brain that we need for thinking and for reasoning, that part of the brain is usually not very accessible when we're in a heightened state of, 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 of emotion. And it takes some time to, to come to bring, bring it down or to shut off that, uh, that amygdala response. Um, so you want to make sure that you are, you know, being what we call co-regulators. Um, and that is modeling calm. Uh, modeling ways to calm calm yourself before attempting to problem solve and reason with with your child. So let me share with you uh, just a few uh, strategies to to do some of that grounding, uh, as we call it. Uh, the first one is called lazy eight breathing. Now you may have heard about square breathing, uh, where you know in the shape of a square, you breathe in for four, hold it, exhale for four. Inhale for four, exhale for four. You're making uh, the shape of a square uh, in when you're breathing. And lazy eight breathing works very similar to that. And this is something that you um, practice for yourself and then model it for for your for your student. Um, and uh, it's simply you know tracing tracing the shape of an eight. You can do it in the air. You can have your child do it actually on the sheet of paper. And with each loop, you breathe in, cross over, exhale, inhale. On the next loop, cross over, exhale, inhale, exhale. And we talk a lot about breathing, um, that it almost becomes cliche you know, at, at, the, at this point, but it is the single easiest thing you can do to self-soothe. Um, it's particularly when you on the exhale, uh, that is when we are sending signals uh, of calm to the brain through what's called the vagus nerve. That's that, that big nerve that runs all the way down your body. It connects to all the organs. And when you, you know, when we say, you know, I, I feel something, I mean, it is a physiological thing that, that is happening. That's the vagus nerve that's sending signals of emotional pain or soothing through through our bodies and the easiest way to access that vagus nerve is through our breathing slow breathing exhaling through our abdomen um, there's also uh, something that you can do we also we've also heard about counting to 10 or taking five uh, so we're going to take that a little differently and yes we want you to take five but we want you to practice counting backwards from 50 using your fives. So it's simple, you know, 
we just count back from 50, 50, 45, 40, 35, 30. That takes a little bit more thinking than counting to 10. And you have to shift. That's Those are different operations in the brain. So counting backwards from five uh, is another way to distract yourself and ground yourself when you are in a heightened emotional state. And then finally, uh, something that's called LPN. Uh, we're not talking about nurses, but you know we do need to do some self-care for ourselves. And LPN uh, is one of those ways. Uh, look, point, and name. Uh, it's a kind of a mini mindfulness technique where you find five things, a number of things in your immediate surroundings, and you simply point to them, say what they are, give a description, look, point, and name. So in my space right now, I, I'm going to focus on five, five things, and I'm just going to shift my attention. I'm going to narrow my attention to something else. I see a picture of a dog. I see a license plate that says proud to be a social worker, a picture frame, a long, large red picture frame with a circle in the middle of it, a light bulb that's bright and it's shining in my face right now. Okay, so that's it. You just shift your attention to some different different things. Uh, you can also do this with hearing. Uh, when I'm working with kids and we're practicing different ways to do mindfulness, I ask kids to, um, close their eyes if they can and want you to focus, find, listen and identify five sounds in the room, inside the room um, and say what they are. This you can do quietly to yourself. We can say it out loud. Then I ask, I want you to see if you can identify five sounds outside of the room. Okay, and that's narrowing your field of attention to something else to shift your mind away from whatever it is that you are thinking about that's causing you stress or that's causing you worry uh, or causing you sadness. Um, so that's how we can uh, use our bodies to uh, to ground ourselves. There's another technique that I want to share with you called the butterfly hug technique, and this is another way of using your body. To, to calm down. The body is, is amazing. Our brain and our body is, is amazing. We have all that we need, really. Um, we do, we have it inside of us. And uh, this technique, what you do is you cross your arms over your chest so that the tip of the middle finger for, for each hand is placed uh, below the collarbone. And your hands and fingers should be as vertical as possible so the fingers point towards the neck. Uh, and not necessarily, you know, out to towards the uh, the arms as as much. So try to point them a little bit uh, up towards your your shoulders, and you cross your fingers here in the middle, um, and it looks like a butterfly. You know, the butterfly flap flapping its wings. Now, it's okay if you know you need a little bit more space. I'm a little bit wider, so my um, so I, I usually separate and, and do it this way. Um, that's how you can do it as an adult, but for, your, for a child with more narrow shoulders, they can certainly do it in the, in the traditional way. Your eyes are closed or partially closed, uh, or you can look down the bridge of your nose, whatever is comfortable for you. And just alternate the movement of your hands, like flapping the wings of a butterfly. Let your hands move freely. And, you know, depending on how charged you are, you know, how the tempo that you use is, it's very different. You know, if you're really upset, it might be faster. Um, but, you know, eventually you want to slow it down and breathe slowly. Inhale, exhale, make sure it's through your abdomen. And while you are doing that, just pay attention to yourself. Pay attention to any thoughts any feelings that come up and just let them go, making sure that you are alternating. And the way the science works with this is you're accessing the left and the right parts of the brain like Mr. Jackson talked about, the left and the right hemisphere. When you get both parts moving, that helps for you to, to calm. It helps shut down that amygdala response. You can also start to offer some affirmations to yourself. 
I'm sad about this, but I know that this 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 too shall pass. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. And you know, you want to do this enough to where you start to feel relief. There's no prescription on the amount of time that you do it. Um, the most important thing is that you give it a try, that you're breathing through it. And you know, eventually you start to feel yourself relax. And that's when you can just stop and you feel some relief. Put your hands uh, on your lap and exhale, exhale. Um, so this is something that you can use to model for uh, for your children. Do it for yourself. Get comfortable with it. And in those moments of calm, show your child how to do this. And in those moments of, of upset, just start doing it. Just start doing it because they will have seen it before. You can do this while you're talking to each other. OK, and you're also sending signals of calm while you're having that conversation, trying to reconnect, trying to get them to get back to a place of calm. All right, thank you so much. I hope that this is something that's helpful for you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, this was all really helpful. I know uh, we've had um, several questions pop up that I think um, uh, They've been answered privately, um, but to to be able to uh, answer them for the good of the group, um, we had one parent ask about um, strategies to support uh, their autistic child. Um, how um, it says, um, how do we deal? How do you deal with autistic children who are used to certain routines uh, when they are uh, when they are surrounded by other siblings? Uh, so not only are so if you're dealing with like multiple children and one has specific needs, um, how do you address that um, in your home and make everything as uh, run smoothly as possible? Hi, uh, this is Taya Gregory, one of the program managers with the school mental health team. I thought I was able to uh, I thought I was responding uh, to the question in the chat, but one of the things that I would say is to the biggest thing is to maintain the routine. And so we know when children are tantruming, they have a need um, that they want to be met immediately. Um, and we know that we are sh the routines now with the distance learning are shifting. So the best thing that you can do is to make sure that your your child is OK. Um, but I think J Douglas said it well, you have to respond even if you're not feeling calm. You have to respond in a calm voice and, you know, make them aware of what you're doing. I'm working with, um, you know, Sasha right now. I will as soon as I get finished working with Sasha, then I will be able to help you. And sometimes it feels like those tantrums don't reduce at that moment. But one of the things that we have to do is to have the same messaging so that children can see. This is what I said that I'm going to do, and you can now see that this is what I'm doing after I'm working with Sasha. I'm now able to respond to you. Also, a, a visual schedule, especially for children with autism. You know, I'm not sure how old your student is, but if you can provide them with a visual schedule and it may be, um, you know, you may have a, a sign for breakfast or, you know, a piece of toast or something for breakfast, a book for schoolwork. But if you can, you know, if you, especially if your student is nonverbal, using those visual charts, just as a reminder, first we're going to do breakfast and then we're going to start our schoolwork. You can also use the first and then strategy just in terms of getting our students to do things that they may not necessarily prefer. First, we're going to read for 10 minutes and then we'll take a five minute. We'll do gold noodle or we'll we'll play with the blocks. So that first and then strategy is also another strategy, but with tantruming, 
especially with the shift uh, in the routine, sometimes it gets a little bit worse before it gets better, but maintaining the routine, maintaining the same response is always very helpful in making sure our students feel assured that I may not get what I want now, but I do know that mom uh, or dad will respond. And so as long as our, we know that our students are safe, then it is okay for them to, you know, even though we don't necessarily want it to happen, as long as we know that they're safe, you know, for them to have a tantrum, our goal is to reduce it. Um, so sometimes we reduce those tantrums by responding consistently. And that, that consistent response may be, first, I, I have to take care of this. And then you see, I took care of Sasha, and now you see I'm right here with you. So I hope that provides some assistance or some help um, in answering your question, but I know that it is absolutely um, a challenging time, especially for students with ASD who really benefit from, you know, the consistency of a routine. Um, and, you know, if you have an eight month old, that's a challenge in, its, in and of itself in terms of, of managing a routine, but your consistent responses and as close to a schedule as you can have, um, I think that will be fairly helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and and thank you so much for answering, uh, you know, specific questions uh, within um, the Q and A, uh, especially the ones that are more personal in nature. I really appreciate that. Um, one of the one of the things that we we keep keep getting um, responses about are the idea of having a routine, and especially for for family for, for families where um, you know you are continuing to work from home or maybe you know one of you is working from home and you have another parent who's um you know you know still continuing to physically go into work um how how do you maintain a routine as easily as possible i, I mean as much as possible um while also um you know, managing uh you know wearing both hats at the same time i'm still trying to figure that out um I, I know that uh, one thing that I try to do is, um, and let me, oh, sorry, y'all. Oops. One of the things that I try to do is block off certain times on, on my work schedule on, uh, so we use Outlook. So what I'll do is I'll block off um, like my daughter's the, the times that I that my daughter needs the most attention so that for me that's lunchtime so when I'm able to block that time off you know I'm able to make I might I have a little bit more control over my calendar than just and and it's set to private um but I have a little bit more control of my calendar than when you know uh, co-workers are just able to throw times on my on my schedule uh, when they check to see oh is Taylor available during those times it marks that I'm not available um, but you know they so they it requires them to kind of come to me and say hey does that time work for you and I can say oh yeah that should be fine and I can make those adjustments on the back on on my end um, you know and and to Nigel's point I was. I was planning on my daughter taking a nap uh, during um, during the workshop. Things don't always work out. Um, so, you know, asking for for grace on your end, if possible, and then also extending that same grace um, to coworkers um, and creating that uh, that uh, community where you know, if if they have a kid who has run onto the screen, you know being okay with it on your end and that creates that can impact office culture as well um i know that we had a question particularly about um again about with the teens we have our teens are very um they they're very opinionated and they might you know it might not be as easy to say um uh you know like oh let's let's try this activity they'll be like mom that's lame Right. So, what are some other activities um, or strategies that you could try to 
to support your teen, um, especially, you know, when they're, you know, they're experiencing and probably more aware of the disappointments than than younger children. Well, let me see. Oh, okay, Nigel. So I, it's a great question. Um, and I'm glad that it's being raised. Um, I have three teenagers and I say that not to qualify myself as an expert, but to qualify myself as somebody who tries and fails at this every single day. Um, so I, I understand they want to go to their rooms. They want to play on their phone that they're addicted to. Um, and trying something new, getting them to sit and watch something with you, all the stuff that we were told, watch a new movie, watch something funny, you know, they don't want to do. They're in that process, which psychologists would call individuation. And then they don't want to do those things with you when they're trying to establish their own thing and what's private, and no boundaries and all of the things that we find in adolescence. I would I want to um, answer this somewhat different than the way that you asked the question, Taylor, and that is. Um, I often say the things that I want to do around my house, I want to clean my garage. Oh, I'm, I'm going to fix this part of my basement. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then when it doesn't get done, I very conveniently say to myself, well, I don't have time because I'm working. Or I just don't have time. Over the last month, everything is closed. We are quarantining. I have no agenda. I have nowhere to go. And when my garage is still not clean, when that part of my basement is still not fixed, I have I really find out that it's not that I didn't have time, it's that I have to deal with something I really didn't want to do and I can't distract or lie to myself. So I say that story just to say that a lot of times what I'm seeing now with my teenagers and I'm sure for many of you parents are seeing with yours, the quarantine is really allowing us to take a real good inventory of the quality of our relationships with our children and with our family members. Sometimes that's not a pleasant experience. Sometimes we're recognizing, oh man, I get so impatient with that child of mine, with that particular child. And it's a moment for you to pause and say, okay, let me figure out where that's coming from. What does that mean for me? And it might not be pleasant because it's hard reevaluating the quality of your relationship with a family member. But this particular time in history and in the world, it's forcing you to spend that amount of time with nothing else. And it's giving us an opportunity to look at the quality of those relationships and to address them where necessary. Now, the strategies for how to do it are important. And I'm sure some of my colleagues will chime in now with some good strategies um, and I could share some as well. But I do think that beneath the strategies, there has to be the humility and the maturity to recognize when the quality of a relationship was already not where you wanted it to be. And perhaps some of what you're experiencing now could just be that being brought to the surface. No, that that's great. And, and, and so actually, um, one of the things that um, we talked about before, um, particularly with the with the art journal, um, how do you, as a parent of a teen or a, a tween, right, um, respect the boundaries of your child, while also making sure that like you're you as a parent are doing your due diligence in you know making sure that they are emotionally and mentally okay uh, it's a great question and um i actually am going to ask miss michelle buchanan tyler to answer that question uh let's see uh, i have two things i think that might contribute to parents with teens um i think privacy is really important uh, but safety is um, paramount. 
uh, I think a lot of our teenagers are experiencing very severe uh, social isolation, my grandson being one. Uh, so, and when they're younger, we thought of things like doing play dates. And I think our teenagers need play dates too in a teenage form. So that would mean parents uh, advocating maybe with another parent that they trust to actually set up some time for those two teens uh, to talk. Uh, everybody uh, doesn't have have uh, maybe the technology levels uh, that they should and they have trouble kind of coordinating. So teens kind of need our help in being able to connect with other teens. I think that's really important for them. I'd, I'd like to, to add to, to that. Um, you know, we as the adults have gotten uh, into the virtual happy hour. Okay, I look forward to that on, on Friday. But, you know, the interacting with each other, you know, there's a social fabric uh, with, with teens. And uh, to Ms. Buchanan's uh, point, um, you, you know, really creating uh, and talking with, with, with other parents uh, to create those spaces if you can do it virtually. So instead of, you know, virtual happy hour, you know, maybe, you know, in the places where there has traditionally been the lunch hour, that is the social time uh, for, for, for students, is creating virtual, uh, virtual lunch, virtual recess with, um, you know, with, with your teen and, you know, with, with, with their friends. Um, and having that as a, a, a regular thing um, and, you know, and ha having them initiate it, um, but schedule it. Uh, and that, you know, is a, is, is a, an, another outlet uh, to, uh, for, for teenagers to uh, just stay con connected uh, with, with each other. Perfect. Thank, thank you all so much. Um, I, I, I do want to be mindful of people's time. This was going so well. Um, and so, like this had me really excited. Um, I, I could have asked questions all day. Um, so as a reminder, we have um, the, the, it's okay, no, no, okay, all right, we're almost done. We're almost done. Um, we have the school and mental health uh, email address to reach out directly to folks on our team for uh, specific questions. Um, the also the Department of Behavioral Health um, phone line uh, and then also you can contact your insurance provider uh, to, uh, to receive a list of in network, network providers. Another thing that I want to flag is that in our um, bit.ly parent backslash parent you stress, we have access to additional resources. Um, it's in, including um, the including um, an, an announcement from um, an, ins an, an insurance provider that is providing um, free uh, telehealth services for DCPS uh, families and students. And so that uh, sheet is there. Um, and then also um, we want to know how we did so, and then, uh, because, you know, we want to make sure that uh, you all are finding uh, all you know th these workshops useful we want to make sure that um you know you feel supported um so please uh fill out the survey at bit.ly backslash parent you eval 19. um another thing we had a lot of good questions about a, that could have that could potentially lead to um, additional topics and so we'd like we'd love to hear from you all about what additional topics um, you'd love to, you'd uh, like support on as well and what you'd like us to touch on um, if that means uh, additional mental health uh, workshops I'd, I'd love to have more of them if it looks like um, maybe navigating enrollment um, or other topics uh, we would love to have you know the workshops that we create uh, really uh, lend themselves to parent uh, want and demand. Um, I do want to thank our uh, amazing presenters again. They This is my second workshop with them and it's a pleasure working with them. Um, thank you all so much. Um, you all are great and thank you. Thank you as well to our moderators who were who were there answering questions. Um, ex we have and you all did a wonderful job. I really appreciate you. Um, we can 
uh, share the the deck will be po posted in that parent you stress bitly link and so you'll be able to access it this way another thing that i want to share is that our um that the every all of the, our workshops are posted on our dcps youtube page and parent university actually has its own uh playlist so if you want to sit there and watch all of them i'd love to see it um I, and we again we would love your feedback um we have, um, I'm sure that some of you all have, most of you all have heard by now that DCPS is rolling out devices. Um, so we have three sessions coming up um, for, um, to help you walk through your new device if you received one from DCPS. And so um, it's, we have one tomorrow from 5 to 6 uh, p.m. Friday um from uh from three to four and then monday in spanish from three to four um and and those don't have rscp links those bitly links are specifically to be able to hop in to the um to the workshop um at the appointed time but again um we love working with you all we lo I, I love uh doing these um so please uh fill out a evaluation so that we can get a stronger sense of what exactly our parents uh, have a need for and 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 what's supporting them. Again, thank you to um, Nigel, Kenya, William, uh, Douglas um, for your amazing presentation. Um, parents are asking for the, for the the slides on uh, online, so this is great. Um, everybody you are doing an amazing job, families. I know that it feels hard um, to wear all the hats at once. Um, give yourself permission to be vulnerable, um, and uh, you know, and be honest with your kids, um, and manage, you know, to help manage their expectations. Um, you know, it's easy to say, "I'll give you ice cream if you let me get to this meeting." If you're going to say that, you got to give them ice cream. After this, everybody deserves ice cream, so treat yourselves. You all have a great one. Um, and hopefully I'll see you at the next one.